they're going to talk about is the beginning of the Cold War and run up to uh, some of the major events, talk about the background to it, and, uh, and get into it. So if you have any questions, just let me know. All right, we have to start with uh, World War II. So in World War II, you can see there in the bottom left, uh, the United States allied with the Soviet Union, so allied with the British as well. And those are the big three they were called, uh, the leaders of the major allied countries. And so the, even as these countries are allying together, it's kind of a, a fragile alliance that's beginning to unravel towards the end of the war. And it, the, the root cause of it is the Soviet Union is this uh, Marxist country, communist, and in opposition, you have the British and the Americans as capitalist, democratic countries. Uh, so it's, just, it's not a great fit. The only reason they're really allied together is that they opposed Hitler. And so once Hitler is defeated, the alliance starts to come undone. And the, the main issue that the uh, alliance unravels over is Eastern Europe. So they, we have the Yalta Conference. At the Yalta Conference, Stalin had promised to allow free elections in Eastern Europe, that he would allow uh, the the uh, exiled leaders in those Eastern European countries who had been driven out by the Nazis to return and decide what form of government they would have. And from the start, he subverted that promise. Uh, now he probably didn't think it was a serious promise to start with. I mean, we know that Churchill didn't think it was all that serious a promise. Uh, the, his expectation was that Stalin would use that area as, as a protective zone. And so there, there is, uh, this is kind of the, the focal point of historians, because we're not really sure what Stalin intended here. Uh, and, and, uh, and since that's true, we can't really figure out for sure who started the Cold War. Because here are the two scenarios. The Soviet Union had been invaded by Germany in World War II. It had been invaded, Russia had been invaded by Germany in World War I. And in both of those wars, the Soviets, the Russians, suffer by far the greatest number of casualties. So maybe the Russians just wanted Eastern Europe as a cushion, as what we call a buffer, to protect themselves against future German invasion. Both the Soviets and the Americans expected that Germany would emerge again as a powerful country, and potentially as a militaristic one. And so they wanted to, to both be ready for that. Uh, but there is, there's a, we can look at this from the other side. Uh, in the 1930s, Hitler's expansionism had gone unopposed, and the result of that was a world war. You know, Hitler got more and more powerful at any step along the way. The Allies could have stopped him. They did not. And so that is the American and British viewpoint here. What if Stalin is the new Hitler? What if this expansion in Eastern Europe is the first step? Uh, and we know that Stalin was such an ultra-paranoid guy. He wasn't all that cooperative anyway. Uh, he tended to engage in Cold Wars. I mean, he had purged even members of his own party. So opposing the United States and, and the British, who were of a completely different mindset than himself, was kind of a natural inclination of Stalin. And so historians are, are divided on that issue, because if the uh, Soviets intended Eastern Europe to be pr purely protective, then what follows, the policies we're going to talk about next, could be seen as an overreaction that uh, forced the Soviets to take a more aggressive approach. But if this was Stalin's first step and, and he was going to expand more, then this was the correct way to contain aggression. This was what was not done in the 1930s. Uh, and and uh, briefly, some of the Soviet archives were opened in the early 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed. And we know that when the Allies tried to accommodate Stalin, Stalin's approach was something along the lines of, we should take advantage of them, they're weak. And when the Allies opposed Stalin, his response was something along the lines of, they're out to get me, I knew it. And so there was really no winning there. So let's, let's uh, take a look at, at what we mean when we say a Cold War. So it's not that there aren't wars, it's not that people aren't being shot, it's that the United States and the Soviet Union do not go to war directly with each other. But there is a conflict, there is a rivalry. And a lot of it is driven by uh, the different set of ideas. The Soviet Union is dictatorial. The United States is democratic. The Soviet Union has embraced this 
uh, government controlled economy, what they call communism in the United States is a uh, capitalist, the government should as much as possible stay out of the economy type of country. And then it, it expands beyond that. Uh, the United States, because communism was an atheist ideology, positions itself as more Christian as time goes on. This is when the phrase under God is inserted into the Pledge of Allegiance. And so they, this is what makes this such an intense conflict. It's not just your normal great power conflict where both are trying to expand and gain influence. It's, it's uh, a set of different worldviews. So up in the right-hand corner, we have the President of the United States at this point, Truman. Uh, FDR had died late in the Second World War, and so Truman, his Vice President, has succeeded. And Truman was much more suspicious of Soviet uh, aims than, than, uh, than FDR was. FDR was a lot more accommodating to Stalin. So you know, th now we come back to this idea of what were the Soviets trying to do. So the Soviets have expanded into Eastern Europe. By the time we get to 1946, 1947, the Soviets are manipulating elections to an even greater degree than before to get friendly, they would call, friendly governments in Eastern Europe. Now, from the Soviet perspective, this wasn't all that different from American manipulation of politics in, in Latin America. Uh, and, the, and there is definitely some truth to that, that there, the, the United States viewed Latin America as something of its own buffer zone. Uh, but here we're, we're going to see the Soviets increasingly acting in, a, in an imperial fashion. So we've talked about mercantilism, where colonies exist to serve the needs of the mother country. And the Soviet... Uh, use of Eastern Europe could be considered mercantilistic. Uh, they forced Eastern European countries to develop the resources that the Soviet Union wanted. So what containment is, is the idea that the United States can't invade Eastern Europe and push the Soviet Union back. Uh, there were proponents of that, that idea, uh, people who wanted to declare war on the Soviet Union. But at this point, the Soviet Union had by far the world's largest land army and the United States would have had to resort to uh, what w would then have been atomic weapons, these fission bombs that they had used in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we didn't have many of those. So this was not a, a for sure thing that we could win a conflict. So what we do instead is we announce that we're going to limit communism to where it already exists. We're gonna stop it from spreading. And there are two sub-policies of this idea of containment. And one is the Truman Doctrine. So in 1947, Truman announces that he's going to provide military support to uh, anti-communist forces in Greece and in Turkey. And so the Truman Doctrine, broadly speaking, says this, the United States will aid militarily, if necessary, any area threatened by the spread of communism. And, and so the, the result of that is communism is defeated in Greece and in Turkey those two countries emerge as allies of the United States. And the United States goes beyond that and, and places eventually nuclear missiles in Turkey, uh, just to the south you can see of the Soviet Union. So the other part of this is that the allies are well aware that communism is appealing to people who are poor, people who are desperate. It was not appealing in the United States because virtually everybody in the United States owns property in one form or the other. Uh, and so what uh, the, the people that communism appeals to are people who don't have enough. Well, in 1947, after World War II, there were lots of people who were poor. Uh, in order to win the war, both sides had bombed factories, roads, railroads, bridges. Infrastructure had been destroyed. Just getting enough fuel to heat homes in the winter of 1947 was a challenge. And, and so the United States responds with uh, a, a very clever policy, a policy that a lot of historians, kind of looking back on other American actions to, to fight communism, wish the United States had, had used more. And that's the Marshall Plan. So remember, after World War I, the United States provided loans to Germany, but did not just give Germany money to rebuild. The United States required Britain and France, our allies in World War I, to repay their World War uh, loans. After World War II, the United States takes a very different approach and, and ultimately a much more successful one. The United States uh, provides money to all of the countries you can see there with the dollar sign, so not Eastern Europe, 
the Soviet Union turns down Marshall Plan funds because they see it as the United States buying influence. But what the United States does is it cancels all the wartime debt and then uh, provides this money to the Europeans in order to help them rebuild. And so the, this was definitely altruistic in a way, but it, it was self-serving in that we knew it would help contain communism, which was our number one aim. And we also knew that a lot of this money would come right back to the United States. The United States in 1945 controlled half of the world's economy. It's the only other time in history we see anything like that is when Britain jumps out to a huge lead in industrialization. So a lot of the, the goods that they would have to buy would come from the United States. And so the result is that not only do these countries recover, they, they, uh, they are going to experience what's known as an economic miracle in much of Western Europe, where growth rates are absolutely phenomenal, uh, unprecedented up to that point. So the Yugoslavia in Eastern Europe is communist, but they became communist under a leader, Marshal Tito, who refused to allow Stalin to have any influence there. And since the, the Soviets had bigger fish to fry at that point, and an invasion of Yugoslavia would have been problematic, Stalin was never able to bring Yugoslavia uh, into what would become known as the Soviet satellites. And so, they, so uh, there were other Eastern European countries that wanted Marshall Plan funds, but Stalin forced them to turn it down. But since Yugoslavia, uh, although communist, was outside of the Soviet sphere of influence, they were able to get that money. So that's why they get mo the, the Marshall Plan money and the other Eastern European countries don't. Uh, so the, again, from the Soviet perspective, what's going on here is the United States is putting military bases under the Truman Doctrine in places like West Germany, in places like Turkey, in places like Japan, and then the United States is, is uh, flooding these areas with money. And so it seems like the United States, from the Soviet perspective, is surrounding the Soviet Union, encircling the Soviet Union with American influence. And so by 1948, uh, we, we are into the Cold War. And so we, we look at the beginning, what we uh, think of with the Cold War is the Iron Curtain. This division between Eastern and Western Europe, uh, the term was coined by Churchill, who claimed that what we have is, is uh, uh, a divide between the uh, free countries of the West and the unfree countries of the East. So communism in the East and capitalism and mostly democracy in the West. Uh, and so it's a metaphor, the Iron Curtain. There was no barrier in much of, of Europe at that point. Uh, so the, the Berlin Wall, for instance, was not constructed until 1961. So there, there is no physical representation of the Iron Curtain. It's a metaphorical division, uh, ideologically as well as, as, uh, as in terms of the influence of the superpowers. So where uh, what becomes ground zero of the, of the European Cold War is Germany. So Germany, it had been uh, agreed upon at the various conferences during World War II that Germany would be divided into four pieces, and the Americans, British, French, and Soviets would each have a piece. Berlin, as the capital, would be divided as well. And often students assume that this is because the Allies wanted to punish Germany or to ensure that Germany didn't start another world war. Uh, the, the main reason was to get rid of Nazi influence. The whole idea was you'd divide up Germany, you'd purge the areas of Nazi influence, you'd maybe help them get back on their feet, and then you'd put the country back together. So this was thought uh, of as a very temporary measure. And, and so the, when the Cold War sets in, that's when it becomes more or less a permanent division between the two. So if we look at the reason why, uh, it goes back to the Second World War, the Germans had invaded the Soviet Union. They had devastated the Soviet Union. They had, uh, in places in, in Eastern Europe, raped women, uh, enslaved people, taken resources back to Germany. And so when the Soviets invade Germany, it's payback time. They, their troops do the same thing. Uh, so meanwhile, we've already talked about how the United States has, has come in and flooded German markets with money, helping them to rebuild. So you have the Soviets, who are uh, bent on punishing Germany and stripping it of resources as much as you can. And then you have the Americans that have 
aided Germany in, it, in its reconstruction. So this is a no-brainer. If Germany was unified, Germany would side with the United States. And so that's the reason the Soviets never allowed Germany to be fully reunified. Uh, but there's always this issue with Berlin. And you can see Berlin deep in East Germany. Uh, under the wartime agreements, the Allies were given access to Berlin. They had roads they could take to Berlin. And so that's what eventually is going to prompt Khrushchev as the General Secretary of the Soviet Union to build that wall in Berlin around the western part of Berlin. Uh, until 1961, if you were in East Berlin, you could just walk across the street and see what life was like in the West. Uh, even today, when pictures are taken of Berlin from the air, you can tell the difference between the much poor eastern part of Berlin and the much more affluent western part of Berlin. So this is uh, symbolic of the division of Europe. Berlin is divided, Germany is divided, and those two uh, will remain divided until the very end of the Cold War. And so it becomes Soviet policy to force this division. And so West Germany emerges as the capitalist democratic part of Germany, East Germany the communist dictatorship. Uh, and, and so they're going to pursue those different paths. West Germany will eventually become one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Uh, so by the time we get to the 1980s, the United States has the largest economy in the world uh, still in the 1980s, and West Germany and Japan are going to have the, the second and third. So the other area we're going to look at is Japan, because again, the Allies feel like Japan and Germany are going to make a comeback, and they could potentially be militaristic again, and, uh, and so they're thinking of these two as allies in the Cold War. That, now, that doesn't materialize. That's not what ends up happening, but that's the thinking. So what happens in Japan is, uh, is remarkable. Because the United States had defeated Japan in a total war. And remember, at the end of that war, the Japanese, uh, because they had been bombarded by propaganda, were deeply afraid of what the, United, the Americans, who they came to see as, as subhuman, were going to do when they, they entered the country. And the United States, leading up to that, had uh, firebombed Tokyo and destroyed the city and dropped atomic devices on two other cities. Uh, and so what happens if we fast forward you know, four decades is that Japan and the United States end up as staunch allies. And this comes out of an American occupation. So the Second World War had completely discredited the Japanese military. And so you have this combination of the Japanese willingness to turn away from the, the things that had led to the Second World War and the American support of the occupation. The United States is, is going to uh, guide the writing of a constitution, which is going to create a parliamentary form of government in Japan that in, endures until this day, and uh, also take some steps to help the Japanese economy get back on its feet. And so the, the result there is Japan today is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Uh, and and it, just like with West Germany, you have something of an economic miracle that occurs in the post-war period. So again, from the Soviet perspective, though, the United States and flooding Japan with, with money and occupying Japan uh, is surrounding the Soviet Union. Here is the, the base of operations for the United States uh, in, uh, on the eastern frontier of the Soviet Union. And the United States absolutely used Japan in that way. Uh, and, and more problematic for the Soviet Union, when uh, World War II ended, the group governing China uh, the, the nationalists, they were also supported by the United States. And so the, the, there's this feeling that the United States has uh, the upper hand for sure. Well, what happens right after the war is that a civil war, we could say breaks out, but it was really resumed. The Guomindang, the Nationalist Party, had been engaged in a civil conflict with the Communist Party. And so the, the, the Nationalist Party was getting a lot of funding from the United States but had not used that funding very effectively. Most of the people in China were, were uh, peasants who lived in the countryside and who owned no land. And yet the nationalists did nothing to make their lives better, instead spending the, the vast majority of the money on the cities. And so the, that is definitely an area of weakness. But what was uh, even more problematic for the, for the Guomindang was the Japanese invasion. When the, when the Japanese invaded, of course, they targeted cities, which hurt the nationalists a whole lot more than it, than it hurt the Chinese.
or hit the uh, the uh, the Chinese communists. So Chiang Kai-shek was the leader of the nationalists, and uh, he was dictatorial. He was corrupt. He uh, was misusing a lot of those funds. This was a constant source of frustration for the Americans, especially during World War II, where we were providing so much money to China, and and uh, Chiang Kai-shek was often misusing it or or hoarding the money. Uh, and so the the nationalists look like they have the upper hand when the war breaks out, but the the corruption and the bad policies are, are going to do them in. So meanwhile, on the other side, we have Mao Zedong. Uh, the, the communist leader, who is also seen at this point as a nationalist hero. Uh, the communists were far more active and successful in fighting the Japanese than the nationalists were. Uh, and so for many of the rural Chinese, uh, they, they see Mao not so much as a communist, but as the, the person acting uh, to their benefit. And, and so this is you know, one of those things that is sometimes hard to understand from the perspective of the Cold War. For many Chinese, they weren't seeing this as a communist versus capitalist type of model. They were seeing this as a corrupt regime versus a more pure regime. Mao Zedong's uh, Communist Party at that point was definitely far less corrupt than the nationalists. And, and they were seeing it as a anti-reform versus pro-reform type of, of conflict as well. And so by 1949, the communists had driven the nationalists out of mainland China to the island of Taiwan and united China under communist rule. So right away, you have this failure of containment. Communism spreads uh, with very little Soviet support. You know, the Soviets were taken by surprise as well. They, they didn't think that the Chinese communists could, could do this. Uh, but once it happens, then the Soviets are happy to establish an alliance. Eventually, that alliance will break up uh, the, the Chinese and the communists, so you can see on the bottom left map, they, China and the Soviet Union shared the longest border in the world. And that border had been established during the age of imperialism. So when the communist revolution occurred in, in China, uh, when the, the Chinese won, communists won the civil war, they went to the Soviets and said, hey, a lot of that territory was taken from us during the age of imperialism. How about if you, you return it now that we're brother communists? And the Soviets said, no. And so eventually there's going to be this uh, rivalry between the two. But early on, it looks like communism is spreading, it's on the rise, and that the policy of containment may not be working. And so what is going to happen as a result of this is that this is going to become a much more global conflict. And so one example of this is NATO. So NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It is the American alliance with, with mostly Western Europe. Uh, an anti-communist alliance to contain communism. And so the, uh, the Americans are now guaranteeing the security of Western Europe, exactly what they refused to do after World War I. And so the United States is committing itself to, to having this uh, presence in Europe. And similar alliances were signed around the, the world. And so one of the other things that's happening during this time is European empires are breaking down, new countries are forming. And so as these new countries are forming, there's going to be a lot of pressure put on them to join one side or the other. So on the other side, we have the Warsaw Pact. That's the Soviet Union and its Eastern European countries that it dominates. Uh, and so you can see not Yugoslavia, which remains outside of, of Stalin's sphere of influence. But this is the, the counterpart to NATO. Uh, and, uh, and so I mentioned the imperial nature of the Warsaw Pact, the, along with the Warsaw Pact, was a, uh, an economic alliance that was formed as uh, the Communist Economic Council, which is short, shortened to Comic-Con. Uh, so it uh, kind of doesn't have the same meaning today as it once did. But the, the, War, the Warsaw Pact countries were uh, re required to produce the resources that the Soviets needed and to buy resources from the Soviet Union that the Soviets needed to sell. And so this is an example of how the world is becoming more and more divided during the Cold War. So what makes this a Cold War and not a hot war is what we see here, the development of nuclear weapons. So in the uh, Second World War, we have the development of the first atomic bomb, which is a fission bomb splitting the nucleus of an atom using neutron bombardment. 
And the Soviets had been spying on the American effort to develop a bomb, so they developed their own bomb uh, three years later. Then, a couple years after that, the United States tests the first nuclear bomb, uh, which is uh, also known as a hydrogen bomb, where you're fusing the nuclei of two uh, hydrogen atoms and, and forming helium. Right? This is what happens on the sun. And so the, this releases a lot more energy. When the United States first tested one of these devices, it just eliminated an island, just blew it off the face of the earth. Uh, and so the, the Soviets are, are going to develop their own hydrogen bombs very shortly after this. And then you can see on the graph, the arms race that results, where both uh, uh, countries end up developing tens of thousands of warheads. And, and so remember, each of these warheads, uh, some of them are tactical, but virtually all of the warheads were capable of destroying entire cities. And so the, the, the two sides reached the point where they can each destroy the world several times over. It was thought at one point that you needed you know, thousands of warheads in order to do that. But what we found since then is that just a, a handful of hydrogen bombs detonated simultaneously, creating fires, would cause uh, nuclear wind, winter, where global uh, temperatures would, would uh, fall and it would kill crops, and that would be the end of that. And so you can see towards the end, there is a decline in the number of nuclear weapons uh, because of disarmament types of, uh, of, of agreements. But what I've just described, this idea that you would have so many weapons, more weapons than you need, leads to what's called deterrence. Deterrence is the idea that nuclear weapons prevent a conflict. And so the Soviets and the United States both have so many weapons. So let's say the Soviets launch a first strike and they wipe out 95% of the American arsenal. So if we uh, you know, take those tens of thousands, 95% means the United States can still destroy every major city in the Soviet Union and the cities of its allies. And, and so that's what deters a conflict. You can't win. If, uh, it, unless you can wipe out 100% and you couldn't, then, then you, uh, nuclear war is going to be an unwinnable war. And so as a result of that, the United States and the Soviets will, will engage in war, but not directly. Uh, and so you can see there the kind of silly ideas that people came up with to try to make themselves feel safe during a nuclear war. The idea was that you could, uh, you could duck and cover or things like that, right? So it's MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, uh, they have, they have uh, come up with. And so they, to give you an idea, um, here is a nuclear device, right? one of the Soviet models, that if we dropped it right on the city of Richmond, uh, what would happen? And so the, the area is kind of in the, the orange-red. That is where the heat is so intense that it would just incinerate people. Uh, people would just be gone. There, there would be nothing left. Uh, at most, what you would have is a shadow from the phosphorus flash where the person used to be. So when, what we all have as well is a wave of force. And so if you look at that blue wave of force, and it, within that area, and so that area extends uh, pretty close to Brander Mill, then you, you would still have uh, the, enough force to knock over kind of unsteady structures. You would definitely blow out the windows of every building that that hits. Uh, we're a little bit past that. So when you look at, at Brander Mill and Woodlake, uh, we would feel the heat, but it wouldn't be enough to, to incinerate people, kill people. We would feel the wave of force. There would be like a wind that blows out, uh, but it wouldn't be enough to really be all that destructive. But the unfortunate thing is we're well within the radiation zone. And so what radiation uh, does is it, it breaks down cells, it kills cells. Uh, it causes mutation of cells. So if you're if you're that close, you're dead. Uh, you're you're just you're going to die in a more painful way, uh, because you're, what will happen is that the radiation over the next <clears throat> uh, week to two week period would start to break down blood vessels. They would start bursting within you. Would cause the skin to peel off your body. Right? So it's a, an, just an awful drawn out way of dying. Beyond that, people would probably be exposed to enough radiation that 
uh, they would suffer from things like cancer down the line. And so the, that is why the two sides never engage in a nuclear conflict. And the, the, uh, the thing that you find as you look into this, to the Cold War, though, is that there are a lot of close calls. So when the Cold War began, the United States didn't have nuclear missiles, it had nuclear bombs. And so we thought in order to be prepared, what we needed to do is have planes that flew over the United States carrying bombs. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the, uh, at all times we'd have planes in the air carrying these atomic weapons. Well, an atomic weapon uh, is made by packing conventional explosives around that radioactive core. And so the idea is you want to maximize the chain reaction by compressing the nuclear core as much as you can with that, that conventional explosive. And, and so for that reason, we're not altogether sure if things like a fire wouldn't set off a nuclear explosion. So far they haven't. But there is one example of, uh, in West Germany, a warehouse where we keep the nuclear weapons and a plane crashes and it goes right into the warehouse, of course, and sets it on fire. And, and so fortunately, the safeguards held. And there's another example. There's a plane that was flying over the continental United States and there was a glitch and it opened the bomb bay doors. And okay, so that's, that's one fail safe blown by. Then there's a second fail safe that uh, prevents the dropping of the nuclear bomb when the bomb bay doors open. But that fails, and the bomb drops into North Carolina. And the third failsafe, which prevented a nuclear chain reaction, held. But it was you know, one of those things where we could have nuked North Carolina accidentally. Uh, and, and the United States is careful. Other countries are much less so uh, with their nuclear devices. And so one of the uh, kind of flashpoints of the Cold War is the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I'll talk about what happens in Cuba when we get to the, the next part of this, but uh, to get kind of build on that idea that things were very close. Now here is an account from the Cuban Missile Crisis. So this account illustrates just how close a call the Cuban Missile Crisis was. A lot of early accounts of the Cuban Missile Crisis focus on President Kennedy of the United States and General Secretary Khrushchev of the Soviet Union and the actions that they took to prevent a nuclear conflict. Uh, but what we now know is that there were a lot of uh, subordinate officers who should have answered to Khrushchev and, and uh, Kennedy, but who had a great deal of latitude to act on their own. And those people could have started a nuclear conflict. And that's what we see here. The United States and the Soviet Union both did this. We, when, uh, for nuclear submarines and even nuclear bombers, what we had to do was, was tell the people who were uh, in charge, you have independent authority to act if, if you get cut off. Because in a nuclear exchange, you can be cut off from communication. So you don't want to lose the nuclear war because you don't have the, the uh, ability communication-wise to respond. And so there's this myth in the United States that the president has the, the codes and the president has to authorize the codes. But typically, the president does what Khrushchev did here. You pre-authorize the use if somebody's going into a danger zone. And so the, on both the American and the Soviet side, there were individuals like this captain of a nuclear vessel who could have, on his own initiative, started a nuclear conflict. Uh, and so it's, it's just luck that we avoided that. That could have happened during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this one, would have led, uh, this one would have led to an escalation. Probably it would have built up to some kind of retaliation in, in Berlin, and that would have been a nuclear war.